Hello, Spartans. Welcome to the backyard of the Silbor Complex. Uh, we're going to move on past reconstruction, and uh, we're going to get past the uh, big business of Carnegie and Rockefeller, and now we're going to move on to the Gilded Age, uh, a time of massive corruption in our government. The term Gilded Age uh, is a spin-off of the term Golden Age. Uh, many of the world empires, including the Egyptians and the Romans and so on, uh, went through uh, what they call Golden Ages, where everything just seemed to be good. Life was prosperous, and uh, the economy was going well, and they were in charge and in power. The Gilded Age comes about from Mark Twain, um, because he was a humorist who used to be very ironic about things. Um, and the term Gilded means something that has of no value that is covered in a layer of gold to make it look like it is worth more than it really is. And so he referred to this period of time as the Gilded Age because it looked like America was doing well and it looked prosperous, but underneath there was just a crap load of bad things going on. So the Gilded Age was the post reconstruction time when corruption and poverty were everywhere, but it was covered up by the look of prosperity thus the term Gilded Age. Businesses believed in laissez-faire government, something that I think we may have talked about in the past. Um, it, it means hands off. It means that government should stay out of business and let business either, either sink or swim on its own and that the government should, should totally stay out of it, no regulation, anything like that. The problem with this is it often led to businesses doing illegal things for profit. One of the biggest examples of this was the Credit Mobilier scandal. Uh, Credit Mobilier was a railroad company uh, that was uh, hired to build at least part of the transcontinental railroad that was approved by Congress during the Civil War. Uh, what would happen is the company would overcharge to make more money. Um, and what they would also do is they would bribe Republicans and Democrats in Congress to look past all, all the corruption that they were using here, um, that the credit mobilia would get paid so much more money than it deserved to build this railroad, and that Democrats and Republicans in Congress were paid off to look the other way so they would make a profit. Really, in essence, what happens is the only people that really got screwed were the Americans. And the scandal wasn't even discovered until 1872, which was years after the fact. Another reason why this is the Gilded Age, um, and this isn't anything new, this goes back to Andrew Jackson and even before, was the use of the spoil system. Uh, elected politicians would give government jobs to loyal supporters who were often unqualified. And often the job did not, did not get done because they were unqualified. So government money went to people who didn't actually earn it. Now, as usually true with history, is things are often a reaction to the things that came before. So with the Civil War happening and Reconstruction being a period of time when people really wanted to do good and rebuild the country and putting all this government money into it, the Gilded Age was a reaction to that. Lots of government money going all over the place. Nobody's really watching over it. Corruption is going to happen. Well, the corruption got so bad that eventually there were people who looked to reform it, but they were climbing an uphill uh, battle on this one. So Rutherford B. Hayes, elected in 1877, you may remember the Compromise of 1877 that we talked about before, was the first to not use the spoil system, and he would only hire qualified workers. The problem with this is that this made him very unpopular with his own party. People turned against him, and so he couldn't even run for a second term because he didn't have his own support, his own party's support. But after this, the Republicans were split between those who wanted the spoil system and those who wanted to reform the civil service or non-elected government workers. So the Republicans running in the next election uh, looked at James Garfield, who was a reformer, and he did win the Republican nomination, but he picked his vice presidential candidate to be Chester Arthur, who was uh, a spoil system supporter. So there was a balance between the old spoil system and reform on this ticket, uh, looking to get the votes of both kinds of people. And they won the, a close election in 1880. That wasn't going to last for long. Uh, Garfield looked to pass what we call the Pendleton Civil Service Act. And the idea is that people would have to take a test before they could take a government job. They would have to prove that they were qualified for the job before taking it. 
there were certain people that didn't like what Garfield was doing. And one was a guy named Charles Guteau, who believed he was one of those people that deserved a government job because he supported Garfield. And when he found out that Garfield was not going to give him a job and that this, the Pendleton Civil Service Act was in play, he found Garfield at Union Station in Washington, D.C., and walked up to him and shot him in the back. Surprisingly, and this is a major surprise, is Chester Arthur, who was not a fan of the, of the reform and was more supporting the spoil system, when he became president when Garfield died, got the act to pass when he took, when he took over. This period of time is one of the dead spaces in uh, the presidential timeline where we just had a number of presidents that really didn't stand out a whole lot. So between Hayes and then Garfield and then Chester Arthur, and then in 1884, a Democrat named Grover Cleveland won election, um, mainly be only because he was seen as less corrupt than the other guy. And then he lost his job in 1888 to Benjamin Harrison. But Harrison really didn't do anything, and he was kind of blah. So in 1892, Cleveland won again. So technically speaking, Grover Cleveland is the 22nd and the 24th president. It's the only time in our history that has happened where the same man was uh, president in non-consecutive terms. Um, but that was it for him also. Um, the second term was a disaster for him, and he was out. So then people look to William McKinley in 1896. William McKinley was a Civil War hero. Uh, he ran against William Jennings Bryan, uh, which you'll hear more about. He's going to give something called the Cross of Gold speech, and he'll actually be a, a lawyer in the Scopes Monkey Trial coming down the line. Um, William Jennings Bryan will run three or four times for president. He'll lose every single time. McKinley uh, was not a very good speaker. And the people that helped him run for president pretty much told him to not leave his front porch. Don't go out giving speeches because it's just not what you're good at, where William Jennings Bryan was very good at it. But people believed in Republican policy. They believed in higher tariffs, a strong gold standard for money. Um, and after winning re-election in 1900, McKinley then was assassinated in Buffalo by an anarchist which surprised everybody because McKinley was so well loved by so many people. Uh, but anarchism was a thing during this time and it's going to become more of a thing as time goes on. Uh, people who are against government of any kind. Uh, and so McKinley gets shot in Buffalo, but he didn't, he didn't actually die until I want to say about a month later from infection because they didn't understand enough about IVs um, and hydration and things like that after surgery. period of time would also see a massive influx in immigration. There have been different waves of immigration that have happened in the United States, uh, and each one is usually um, marked by a certain group of, or kind of people that move to the United States. Uh, but this one in particular was pretty big. So people from around the world were moving from farms to the city. So that was one thing. It was a domestic migration. Um, and this led to people immigrating to the U.S. mainly to escape things like crop failures, and lack of land in other countries, rising taxes and famine, and also political and religious persecution. So if you felt like you were in danger in you know, one of your European countries or Japan or China, or whatever, uh, and there was a better opportunity here in the United States, uh, you could move here. And between 1865 and 1920, 30 million people came to the United States, which is a, a huge amount of people for that time. Most of them got here in what we call steerage, which is the large open area below the deck of a ship where conditions often were horrible. Uh, you can imagine there won't be a whole lot of bathrooms down there, if any. Um, people did die, people got sick, um, lack of food and so on. And they paid a lot of money for that voyage across the ocean. Most of the immigrants during this time came from Germany, Great, Bit Great, Great Britain and Ireland up until 1890, but after 1890, it was more from the Eastern European part of the continent where Greeks, Italians, Jewish people, often from Russia, and Armenians were the main uh, influx of immigration that came in. Now, because of the numbers coming in, um, we needed a way to make sure we knew who was coming in, whether they were safe and not carrying disease and so, and so on. So in 1892, 
New York City opened Ellis Island, which is right near the Statue of Liberty. This was supposed to be a gateway for immigrants to enter the United States. So you can see here, this is Manhattan and the Statue of Liberty would be down here. Ellis Island is here. It's actually closer to New Jersey than it is to New York. But people would be brought here and then they would be brought to Manhattan after, afterwards if they passed the quarantine. All of those who entered into Ellis Island had to go through a physical exam. Anyone that was found with a contagious disease like tuberculosis, which is a, a massive killer during this time, was either quarantined or isolated for a period of time, or they were sent back to their original country. So you can imagine what that must have been like if you just got off the boat, were told you had a disease, and then they put you back on a boat to spend weeks to go back to the country you were trying to leave from. They were then, after they passed the quarantine, let into the city. But they were often taken advantage of by criminals who took their money for lodging and jobs, but never delivered on their promise. Employers often paid them much less for doing very hard work. The number of immigrants coming into the cities uh, allowed for ghettos to be set up. And ghettos are not necessarily what we consider them to be today. Ghettos were just uh, areas of the city where one ethnic group was dominant. So examples would be Little Italy and Chinatown because the people of that ethnic background would all congregate in that one part of the city uh, where their language would be the same, their culture would be the same, and they would feel comfortable. M many immigrants into the West Coast were from Asia, obviously crossing the Pacific, uh, and many of them came from China and Japan specifically. They were very different from the Europeans and Americans, uh, and they became easy targets for hostility. And that squeaking is my dog playing with his ball right now, so I apologize. Um, they were very different in look. They were different in culture. Uh, they oftentimes were different in work ethic. Uh, they would do a lot of really nasty work uh, very, very well for very cheap amounts of money. Uh, this upset unions. Uh, so California unions in particular were very upset that Chinese laborers were hired over whites because that would take jobs away from the so-called Americans. Uh, they worked very hard for much less pay. Some also claimed that Chinese were physically and mentally deficient. They were seen like that back then, uh, that they just weren't as smart because of how they sounded. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited Chinese laborers from entering the United States and that would last until 1943. If a Chinese person wanted to come here, they had to get a note from the government saying that it wasn't to work and that they weren't gonna take advantage of the conditions over here, that there was a legitimate purpose for them coming to America. There was also a similar policy against Japanese immigrants. San Francisco's school system made a policy that Chinese, Japanese, and Korean children should go to a separate school away from the white Americans. Japan, the government of Japan protested. Um, they found it to be very dishonorable. And President Teddy Roosevelt compromised with the gentleman's agreement. The school policy was ended and the Japanese government stopped sending laborers to the United States. During this time, the US also encouraged Mexican labor to cross into the United States to help with agriculture, mining and railroad. So pretty much the opposite of what we look at today. Um, where we try to keep Mexican immigrants out, where you know, there's a lot of talk about building a wall and things like that. During this time, they encourage Mexican labor to cross into the United States to do the, the land work, the, uh, the farming work, and so on. The Mexican Revolution plus new jobs encouraged many of them to move to the United States. And this was one of the big reasons that we had such a productive boost uh, during World War I. So between big business, um, especially with steel and oil being made available, uh, skyscrapers being built, immigrants coming into the city, uh, people moving from the farms into the city, African-Americans moving from the south up to the north into the city and so on, um, the cities were growing exponentially. Uh, huge changes going on during this time in urban areas. So this is a picture of New York in 1873. It's not great, it's a painting. Um, but if you look down here to 1913, which is only 40 years later, you can see the big, big differences in the kind of buildings and uh, how much transportation was going on.
also, because of the, the massive changes in transportation, uh, horse-drawn carriages, trolleys, subways, elevated trains, all of these came about right around the same time. This would allow people to be able to move in and out of, it, in and out of the city very easily. Uh, and instead of living in the city, they could move out to what we now call the suburbs or the suburban areas. Um, so they wouldn't have to live in the cities, it could be cheaper, and it would maybe decrease the population, or at least the, the population density. The Bessemer process made steel cheaper, we talked about this with Carnegie, and allowed for the building of skyscrapers. If you were using just iron instead of steel, you couldn't build buildings that were much more than about 10 stories high. With steel, it, it felt like it was almost um, impossible to reach a limit. Um, you can see a picture here of some guys working on a building that is you know, well above the city. Uh, the Empire State Building is gonna reach 100 stories above the city and so on. Uh, with that, obviously, you're not gonna wanna take the stairs. So Elijah Otis created an elevator so that people could get up to the top floors without having to take all those stairs. To house the many workers moving to the city, they started to build these cheap tenements. Um, these were cheap apartment buildings, often crammed with families and in very, very bad conditions. Uh, and when we say families, we're not necessarily talking about a family of four. We may be talking about an extended family, eight, 10, 12, 15 people, it depended. Uh, a number of these tenements in one area would create what we now call a slum. Overcrowded, very neglected, very poor. Uh, soot from coal-fired steam engines and boilers polluted the air. Open sewers polluted the streets and water. So when you're walking out in the streets, you are not just walking in you know, water that's from the rain, you're walking in open sewage. People were dumping the sewage out into the streets. Um, the air was ridiculously polluted. Uh, people had a hard time breathing back then. If I remember right, there was a mortality rate for children uh, under five at about 25%. So one out of four children would probably die from the conditions. And because everybody was so crammed together um, and you know there wasn't a whole lot of uh, fire uh, rules or any kind of emergency rules or anything like that, um, if a fire broke out, it was going to spread very quickly throughout the entire city. Um, and it, that did happen like the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. There would be another one in San Francisco in the early 1900s where just the entire city gets wiped up by a fire. Some people believe that the lack of open windows and ventilation spread disease which was probably true. Fresh air gets rid of the disease or at least takes it out and makes it less susceptible. A new law required a window in each apartment, which led to the formation of what we call the dumbbell tenement. And the reason why it's called the dumbbell is because if you looked at it from the sky down onto the roof, it does look like a dumbbell. But again, the situation wasn't great. The conditions were not very good. Uh, this was better than the original tenement, but it was still very, very crowded with little air and tons of pollution within the city. Right? River water was polluted. Some states built reservoirs outside the city and purified the water on the way into the city. So as an example, closer to home, um, Boston's water supply is pretty much from the Quabbin Reservoir out in the western part of the state. Um, it didn't exist until we made it exist. Uh, there used to be towns there and then they cleared out the towns and they dammed up the rivers and they created this open water source and this massive tunnel system that would bring the water into Boston and allow people to live in that city with pure water. The rivers at the time, you know, you can probably imagine why the rivers were so polluted. Uh, the Blackstone River right here in town was one of the most polluted rivers in the country for a long period of time. You had mills that were dumping all the pollutants from factories um, into the river. Sewers oftentimes went directly to the river. Um, fertilizer runoff oftentimes went straight to the, to the river. Uh, you did not want to drink from this and you didn't want to eat fish from this if you could help it. In 1901, finally, New York City required apartments to have running water, toilets and tubs.
So many people didn't actually even know what slum life was like. Um, if you didn't live there yourself, you probably didn't understand. Uh, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Uh, a man named Jacob Rees published a book on how the other half lives. And what he did is he took pictures and he showed the world how people were living in these slums. And what this did is now that people finally knew about it, uh, it forced the cities to do something about it. Uh, city governments were forced to raise taxes to increase police, fire, health, sewer, transportation, electric, and water services, because these are basic necessities for any person to live. The increase in, in money and responsibilities led to the formation of what we call political machines. Now, these are both good and bad. Um, they would lead to a, a lot of corruption, which we'll get to in a minute. Political machines were led by what we call a boss. Um, and the boss tries to keep a political party in power through money, force, and oftentimes illegal activities. They would give jobs or money to poor residents in return for their votes. And then what they would do is they would get the person that they wanted in as mayor or governor. And then that boss in political machine could control that mayor or governor or the chief of police or whatever the case may be so that they could continue their illegal activities get their money and stay in power. One of the most famous bosses was a man named Boss Tweed from the Tammany Hill, sorry, I should say Tammany Hall, the Tammany Hall machine in New York City. Uh, and again, they usually controlled all the elected officials because they helped these people get elected. Uh, governor, selectman, mayor, police chief, whatever the case may be. This would increase the corruption of the Gilded Age. Now that's not to say that they didn't have a hand in doing some good things too. Um, they did help to take care of some of the poor people that, that needed it, but the return was that they got away with things like gambling and prostitution and murder um, and staying in control and doing what they wanted instead of what was good for the, the common good. And again, that's gonna lead to reform. Because of the shocking conditions that people in poverty endured, many charity organizations rose up some gave help depending on if they felt the person was worthy or not. Immigrants were expected to be more American in how they cooked and cleaned and so on. Some were offended, some were grateful. Some churches started what we call the social gospel movement and they applied the teachings of Jesus to modern society, kind of like a, what would Jesus do type of thing. Labor reforms and better living conditions of the poor were also examples. Some reformers created settlement houses. And these were like community centers that provided social services. So if you went to Jane Addams Hull House in Chicago or Lillian Wald's Henry Street Settlement in New York, um, you could oftentimes get the things that you needed. If you needed someone to watch the kids while you went to work, they could provide that for you. Um, if you needed some food, they oftentimes could get that for you. Um, if you needed some kind of health care that you couldn't get a, a, you know, with a doctor because you couldn't afford it, they could oftentimes give that to you. By 1910, there were about 400 settlement houses. And finally, there's gonna be repercussions on that also. And again, we, we see this in our society now. Um, some people blame the immigrants for many of society's problems. Nativism was the idea that native born Americans should be treated better than immigrants. Um, why are we putting government money towards immigrants and their conditions when we didn't ask them to come here? Uh, they took the chance on their own. That's our money. We should be taking care of Americans. And, you know, there's plenty of, of United States born people that need it more than immigrants do. And then there was prohibition, which was the attempt to rid society of alcohol and all the problems that it caused. Many blamed immigrant customs for too high of an alcohol use. There was a group known as the Purity Crusaders who tried to eliminate certain vices, especially things like drinking. Uh, but other kinds of immoral behavior too, like gambling and prostitution and other drugs. Opium was a big one during this time. And they would put pressure on politicians to make laws against this. So as you can see, there's a lot of changes during this time. We covered an entire chapter just then. Um, big government, a lot of money you know, flowing around. There's going to be corruption when there's government money. Uh, many immigrants coming in, the, the city's growing exponentially, uh, and all the effects that are going to come down all at the same time. And just like technology of present day, 
the technology is going to grow quicker than the regulations and our knowledge. Uh, bad things are going to happen. It takes time for the government and the people to catch up. And that's what's going to happen with the Gilded Age. This eventually will lead to the progressive era with Teddy Roosevelt, um, where they will make some changes, but it will take some time. So again, I know this is kind of lengthy. I hope this helps a little bit. Um, I'll attach this to the question sheet for this week's assignment. And I think I'm gonna also add one small video on the uh, education reforms for chapter 16 with it, just as kind of a, a sideshow. But uh, thanks for listening guys and uh, hopefully this helps.